Now that we have talked about the cells that are typically utilized in tissue engineering, as well as the properties of the extracellular matrix, uh, we're now going to start talking about the scaffolds themselves. So in tissue engineering scaffolds, we need to, or tissue engineering field, we need to utilize scaffolds that are three-dimensional uh, and that can be made from either synthetic, natural, or hybrid materials, and that are used to recapitulate or to mimic the properties of the extracellular matrix and provide the needed mechanical and biomolecular cues to the cells to grow and function. Because of that, the requirements that we have for these tissue engineering scaffolds are listed here. We have to have a three-dimensional architecture. It cannot just be a surface. It actually needs to be three-dimensional to uh, resemble a tissue. It needs to have this uh, suitable mechanical properties to resemble those of the tissue that we're trying to regenerate. It has to be biocompatible in terms of being non-toxic to encapsulated cells or to the host tissue. It needs to have controlled biodegradability, where basically the degradation rate of the material needs to match the degradation rate uh, or needs to match the uh, proliferation rate of the cells and the rate of extracellular matrix production by those cells. If this is not true or if this doesn't happen, then the scaffold could collapse basically if it degrades too fast or the scaffold could impede cell growth if it is degrading too slowly. The scaffold also needs to have high porosity to enable mass transport uh, of nutrients, oxygen, uh, waste, metabolites, and degradation products, as well as of cells uh, to be able to form a functional tissue. It needs to have minimal uh, immunogenicity and it needs to be bioactive, meaning that it has to be more than just a structure. It also needs to provide cell adhesion molecules for the cells to be able to attach to and be able to, to grow with, and it has to provide signaling molecules to direct uh, tissue growth. It basically needs to mimic the interaction of tissue with the extracellular matrix. And as we mentioned earlier, it needs to also provide sp spatiotemporal control of cellular microenvironment to steer or guide the cell function and behavior. And this is especially true if we are utilizing uh, stem cells, where we need to direct their differentiation into specific cell types. And it's been shown that um, spatiotemporal control is important. A dynamic structure that changes the cues as the time goes along is important. Oops, sorry. All right, so the scaffolds for tissue engineering, there's at least three main types. The first type is decellularized tissue, which are basically collagen-rich matrices. These are made by taking uh, normal tissues, such as urinary bladder, uh, intestines, or even hearts, as you will see in some examples later, that are processed through both mechanical and chemical manipulation to remove all of the cell components. And so what you're left with is basically just the collagen-rich matrix or the extracellular matrix, the insoluble parts of your extracellular matrix. Uh, that process is known as decellularization. Uh, what you're left with is basically, as I mentioned, the extracellular matrix proteins that, um, that form basically a three-dimensional scaffold. And so you are retaining, for the most part, the mechanical properties of the original tissue, and you are retaining some of those biomolecular cues uh, uh, without actually having cells. So you could utilize that as a material, as a scaffold now, for incorporation of other cells or for use in a different, uh, in a different uh, patient, for example. Uh, number two would be naturally derived polymeric materials. These are, uh, they have benefits and drawbacks. One of the benefits is that they are degradable, but at times it might be difficult to match the, uh, the degradation rate to the tissue growth. Uh, there is a small possibility of immunogenic immunogenicity when utilizing natural materials, and so that's something that is of concern. Another problem with naturally derived polymeric materials is that there can be a variability in the source uh, because they are not synthesized, uh, there's no quality control, right? The, you obtain whatever you are able to obtain from the, uh, from the animal, plant, or human that you are deriving these materials from. Uh, but the benefits of this uh, is that they support cell attachment and proliferation because they have the right molecules to do so. 
Number three would be synthetic polymer systems. Typically, hydrogels is what we're talking about here or, or, uh, or hybrid materials. Uh, they have good mechanical properties that resemble those of soft tissues. For example, uh, they basically would be able to take one to 10 kilopascals uh, in terms of uh, mechanical stresses. Um, they, have, they are highly porous, as we already know, for hydrogels, which is good for effective mass transport. They can be easily synthesized to a number of mild processes, such as free radical polymerization, uh, which can be initiated by UV initiators, thermal initiators, or redox uh, initiators. We can also prepare those hydrogels by ionic gelation or by uh, orthogonal chemistries, such as click chemistry. Uh, these hydrogels are also easily to functionalize to provide bioactivity uh, and growth factor delivery, and that can be by either a, a covalent attachment of the bio biomolecules or by entrapment of some of these agents within the cross-linked polymer network. As we mentioned in the previous video, uh, the first type of tissue engineering scaffolds are those that are made from decellularized tissues. One of the key players in this field is Dr. Doris Taylor, who initiated this work at the University of Minnesota, but has since moved to the Texas Heart Institute in Houston. The idea in this process is that we're going to utilize tissues from either humans or animals to uh, obtain a very uh, intricate extracellular matrix scaffold that could then be utilized for wound healing applications or tissue engineering applications. And basically by decellularizing the tissue, what you're left with is the native, native scaffold that has the appropriate microenvironment, meaning the extracellular matrix and the vascular network, which would be needed for organ regeneration. Here we see some examples of the tissues that have been decellularized successfully, for example, heart, liver, lung, kidney. Uh, and so potentially uh, this technique could be utilized for many types of tissues where basically we're being able to leave a, a scaffold that has the right geometry, the right uh, uh, architecture, the right uh, molecular cues, and the right uh, physical uh, or mechanical characteristics to be able to regenerate an organ. Um, this paper right here was uh, the paper by Dr. Taylor that actually showed that they could take a heart from a donor rat, uh, decellularize it, and then um, re-inject it with a new set of cells from another animal. And within a couple of days in a bioreactor, that uh, heart could begin to beat again. So this paper was really one of those that could show that, wow, this is really possible. It might be possible in the future to regenerate a functional organ, one as complicated one as the heart. So I highly encourage you to look at this paper if you can. As we mentioned, uh, we need to basically expose, uh, or, or to be able to decellularize these tissues, we need to expose this, the tissues to a set of solutions that have the role of uh, lysing the cells and dissolving cellular components to be able to remove them while leaving the extracellular matrix, or at least most of it, in place so that the tissue uh, scaffold is still there. Some of the solutions that have been used are listed in this slide. Those include acids and bases, hypotonic or hypertonic solutions, non-ionic detergents, ionic detergents, solvents, and enzymes, and all of those have benefits and drawbacks. For example, a hypotonic solution or hypertonic solution, what it will do is to lyse the cells by osmotic shock, but it doesn't actually dissolve the cell components, and so you're left with the cell residues in there. And so, Typically what's done is that a combination of these substances are utilized to be able to take advantage of the benefits of each of them while, uh, making, while basically taking care of the limitations of each of them. Um, um, I just wanted to mention that here at the bottom I have put the structure of one of the non-ionic detergents, Triton X100, that is used uh, significantly in this field, uh, which is used to disrupt DNA protein interactions, lipid-lipid interactions, and lipid-protein interactions, uh, but that might also have the ability to remove the glycosaminoglycans, which is not a thing that we want to do. We actually want to leave those in place ideally. And here on the right-hand side I have shown the structure of um, 
SDS, which is an ionic surfactant or ionic detergent, which is utilized to solubilize cell membranes, but also, just like the other surfactant, tends to remove the glu glu uh, glycosaminoglycans as well as damage, damage some other, of the other uh, biomolecules that are necessary to stimulate uh, tissue or cell adhesion and cell growth. Uh, now, all of these solutions can be administered to the um, to the tissues by either perfusing, basically utilizing the existing blood vessels, uh, and basically perfusing through those blood vessels to be able to reach all of this, all of the areas of the tissue, or or alternatively by immersing the tissues in those solutions. And as I mentioned, typically what's done is a series of uh, these solutions will be utilized. Uh, either in combination or consecutively to be able to remove the cell material that is that wants to be remo removed. Um, in this paper, this is just one of the examples also of utiliz utilization of this method. I just wanted to show you the methods that they used. Specifically, they utilize a four-hour perfusion with a hypertonic solution of sodium chloride. Uh, I should mention that the uh, concentration of sodium chloride in our body or in blood is typically 150 millimolar. So here they have a hypertonic solution. Then they do a perfusion for two hours with a hypotonic solution with 20 millimolar of sodium chloride. Uh, after that, they perfused with uh, SDS or sodium dodecyl sulfate uh, for one hour again. And then finally, they did a wash with phosphate buffer saline, which is basically just to be able to remove any of the leftovers of these solutions. Uh, and with that, they were able to, to show um, good results in terms of decellularization. Um, in this slide, I just wanted to show some of the clinical products that are made from decellularized tissues. As you can see, some of those are utilizing human dermis as the source or bovine dermis. Uh, some of them are going to be utilizing uh, intestines or bladder. Uh, some of them are going to be utilizing uh, heart components. Uh, and, uh, and yes, all of these are clinically available and the applications are listed here on the right hand side. As you can see, the applications are typically for soft tissue regeneration, for cardiac tissue regeneration, for valves, at, like heart valve replacement, or for wound healing applications. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it's been shown that we can, we can basically decellularize tissues and then we can uh, add new cells and be able to recellularize it. And so the idea could be that we could utilize a donor, uh, either human or animal, uh, and be able to remove their cells because those are going to be the most immunogenic. Then hopefully we would be able to use stem cells, uh, ideally autologous stem cells from the patient's own cells to be able to reestablish the, the organ and then be able to implant it in the, in the patient such that, uh, immuno, um, such that there would not be an immune reaction to the tissues. Uh, so that's the overall idea. And as I mentioned, they have been able to show that during that process, they are able to actually get a beating heart again. Um, I have posted here two uh, YouTube videos that I highly, highly encourage you to watch that are focusing on the use of decellularized tissues. Uh, the, this, the first one is focused just on the work of Dr. Doris Taylor. The second one uh, has a compilation of the work of a couple of the key scientists in the field, including Dr. Robert Langer from MIT, as well as Dr. Uh, Doris Taylor as well. The second type of materials that can be used for the development of tissue engineering scaffolds are natural materials, including proteins and polysaccharides. In terms of proteins, we have already discussed collagen and elastin. Uh, fibrin is a new one, which is, uh, as you guys know, fibrin is a structural component of blood clots. It is formed from the reaction of fibrinogen uh, through, uh, with thrombin. Uh, it, is basically, it basically consists of a polymerized fibrinogen that results in the formation of a fibrous mesh uh, that can then be used as a scaffold. Silk fibroin is another interesting material in that it has very high strength relative to its weight. 
and it also has very slow degradation. And so there has been some investigation into the use of this material for tissue engineering scaffolds, but not a lot, sometimes because the degradation rate might, might not match uh, that which is needed for some tissues. In terms of polysaccharides, uh, the ones that have been investigated for tissue engineering applications include hyaluronic acid, alginate, chitosan, and cellulose. And we'll talk about some examples of their use in this area in a little bit. Now, the benefits of utilizing natural materials include the fact that some of these materials might already have the right uh, biomolecules or biomolecular sequences to enable cell adhesion to occur. For example, we said that collagen can bind to other uh, proteins, enabling uh, cell adhesion uh, through integrins to take place. These materials might also enable cell-mediated proteolysis for tissue remodeling. What that means is that the enzymes that are generated by the cells can actually uh, cleave these uh, natural polymers, and so that could lead to degradation that is controlled by cell uh, biomolecules, as opposed to utilizing just hydrolysis with some synthetic polymers, where water, which is ubiquitous, uh, would be controlling the degradation rate. Another benefit is that they tend to have low toxicity because most of these materials are ubiquitous in the, uh, in the patient's bodies. Now, the, the drawbacks of utilizing natural materials are that you are going to lack well-defined composition in that it can be different in different uh, species. Uh, you don't have control over the molecular weight, for example. You don't have control over the overall assembly size of the proteins. And, and so you, you, you lack a little bit of control uh, and that can, be, that can lead to differences in the material from one batch to another, uh, which comes to number two. In addition to that, you might need to do very strenuous purification, especially if it's being uh, utilized, if you're obtaining this material from a different animal or even from a different human, then you need to purify it very well to make sure that you don't bring any contaminants to the patient. And finally, there can be some immunogenicity uh, when you utilize material from a different species. Okay, some examples of the use of natural materials in tissue engineering applications include uh, Appligraph. So Appligraph is an artificial skin that is utilized for venous leg ulcers or diabetic food ulcers. Uh, it was first bioengineered, uh, or, or it, it, it was the first bioengineered cell-based product that was FDA approved in the 1990s. Uh, it is considered a class three medical device because it's not just a, a, a material, like an inert material, but it also includes cells. Uh, so it, it poses a more significant risk. Uh, the structure is basically a bilayer. They, the way that they prepare it, it takes a 20 day period uh, and it's done in a clean room to enable sterility. And basically what it's done is that they begin with a um, collagen one scaffold and in that collagen one scaffold, they see human fibroblasts. Uh, after some time, then they add a second set of cells, keratinocytes here on the top, and they grow those keratinocytes for a number of days. Um, that enables uh, a lot of uh, cell signaling to take place and it enables the cells to start kind of having the right kind of structure uh, for the interface between the two types of cells. Uh, after some period, then they uh, basically expose the top layer of the keratinocytes to air to, in order to form the stratum corneum, which is basically a layer of dead cells. So as you can see, the overall structure that develops is very similar to the structure of human skin. And that was the whole idea, to be able to develop a, 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 a scaffold to regenerate skin. And that skin can then be applied to the patients. I highly encourage you to look at this second video uh, that describes the preparation and the characteristics of this material uh, so that you can see the complexity of it, uh, but at the same time how, how cool it is that you can actually uh, grow this type of tissue that could be used for, uh, for wound healing applications. Um, I have grayed out the top, um, the top link as they have, uh, that, that video is no longer available, but I just wanna keep it there in case that it comes back in the future, but you can definitely uh, look at this second video. <clears throat> A second type of material are these alginate scaffolds. Uh, so alginate is the uh, disaccharide that is shown here on the right-hand side. It is made from gluronic 
uh, acid and uh, manuronic acid. Uh, this is a polysaccharide and it is a linear polymer uh, and as you can see it is an anionic polymer by virtue of the carboxylic acids that we have on all of the repeat units. Uh, it is uh, derived from algae and because of that it is foreign to mammal ce mammalian cells <coughs> Sorry, which means that it cannot be degraded enzymatically in humans. I apologize. And, and that is a drawback for this, but it could still be utilized for some uh, wound healing applications. Um, it is also bioinert in that uh, no cell adhesion occurs to it. And so that might be not beneficial in a lot of tissue engineering uh, applications. <coughs> but it could definitely be helpful for a wound healing application where you want to be able to remove the material without taking the new tissue with it. Sorry, um, on the right hand side here, we can see that this uh, disaccharide, or this polysaccharide, I should say, is cross-linked uh, through an ionic um, gelation by addition of calcium ions. As we said, that we require a divalent uh, cation to be able to cross-link polymer chains together, forming these kind of structures, which are basically hydrogels. Uh, the applications of these alginate scaffolds are for wound, when wound dressings and to enable them to be micro, um, to prevent uh, infection, they include uh, silver within them to uh, be able to basically uh, kill bacteria. Um, this material has been utilized uh, for wound healing applications, as I mentioned. Uh, it's really good in that it can absorb a lot of exudate or a lot of the fluid that is generated in the uh, wounds. And it basically absorbs the water forming a gel. Uh, it can be easily removed uh, by simply adding saline. Of course, we already said that no cell adhesion occurs onto it, but in addition to that, if you add saline, the saline will come and basically wash off the calcium ions, uh, overall allowing to kind of dissolve a little bit of the hydrogel and enabling easy removal uh, to prevent any further damage to the um, healing tissue. It is very good for primary and secondary burns, for ulcers as well, uh, venous ulcers and diabetic ulcers. The next type of example is fibrin scaffolds. Uh, fibrin is produced by the cross-linking of fibrinogen. So fibrinogen reacts with thrombin uh, to be able to start polymerizing here. And basically the polymerization is just kind of the attachment end-to-end -end of the fibrinogen. Initially it forms these protofibrils, those protofibrils then aggregate into fibers, and those fibers can start kind of branching off, forming a hydrogel uh, at in the end. Uh, the fibrin is a major participant in blood clot formation uh, together with um, platelets. Uh, it is isolated from blood and it is degradable by action of the enzyme plasmin. So we have two, two proteins, one protein that actually enables it to form, one protein that enables it to be degraded. Um, uh, let's see what else. The, uh, the degradation can actually be fairly quick. Within about two weeks, uh, this material can be degraded. And it has been uh, utilized as a sealant uh, for bleeding control and for wound healing applications, where basically it can act as a glue uh, and it can actually stimulate capillary growth. This table right here is, just, uh, is from the Front Biomaterial Science book and it lists a number of different types of natural materials on the left uh, column. And next to it is the source of those materials. Here on the middle, you'll see uh, the characteristics of those materials in terms of their chemical structure, as well as their uh, properties, uh, mechanical properties or degradation capabilities. And then on the right-hand side are some of the examples of the products that have been developed from them. Uh, in terms of the sources of the material, I just wanted to point out that a lot of these materials are obtained from algae, from animals, from crustaceans, uh, or they might be synthetic.